see if I can get on Okay, so let's get started. So this afternoon's speaker is Massimo Scanziani. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Today I'm going to present data by Anthony Lee, and he was a graduate student in my lab, he's now a postdoc. In, um, in, uh, at UCSF, and uh, he did uh, some truly outstanding yet unpublished work that I'm going to present to you today. So moving stimuli are um, very salient stimuli, very important, ethologically speaking. In fact, there are animals that only see stimulus if, if it's moving. Um, a signature to a moving stimulus was first reported, an electrophysiological signature was first reported about 60 years ago in uh, the brain uh, by Hubel and Wiesel, who noticed that uh, neurons in primary visual cortex of cats not only responded to edges of luminance that had an orientation, but also could preferentially respond if that edge of luminance would move in one direction, a direction which is per per perpendicular to the main axis of the stimulus, right? But not to the other, right? This is a, um, an oriented edge. This is a, um, an electrophysiological recording, extracellular recording from the oscilloscope. Here you see spikes in response to this edge moving in this direction, right? But much fewer, uh, much less activity from this neuron when that same edge move in the opposite direction. So the mechanisms, the mechanisms uh, underlying uh, the uh, underlying direction selectivity in the cortex have been speculated a lot upon, but uh, but we are still uh, there is still no conclusive uh, um, accepted mechanism for how for how it is it emerges for for how it appears. Uh, there are models that suggest that uh, um, the direction selectivity in cortex uh, emerges through intracortical circuit, right? There are other models uh, uh, also supported by quite uh, um, some literature that uh, suggests that direction selectivity emerges at the convergence of uh, uh, thalamocortical inputs, right? And then more, more recently, uh, work uh, mainly spearheaded by, by our understanding of direction selectivity in the retina of the mouse suggests that maybe direction selectivity in cortex uh, is at least in large part uh, simply inherited right uh, from early stages of, of visual processing. And so today I would like to address which mechanism might actually occur in the visual cortex uh, of the mouse and I'm going to do this first by focusing right uh, on the, the thalamic input uh, onto, onto cortical neurons. Uh, so when we do, the, 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 the approach is going to be uh, mice, those mice are anesthetized, they are in, in, in front of a monitor, and we're going to perform a whole cell recording from a layer 4 neurons. Those whole cell recording will be either in current clamp or in voltage clamp. If you do a current clamp um, whole cell recording from a layer 4 neuron, and you present uh, drifting gratings uh, as a visual stimulus, and you present those gratings uh, in various orientations, drifting in various directions, you can see that uh, in this particular case, uh, um, uh, an oriented grating drifting uh, towards 11 o'clock produce uh, robust firing in this particular neuron, right? While the, <laughs> the same grating with a different orientation and different direction produce much less firing. And so you can explore this parameter space <clears throat> and end up with a polar approach that tells you which one is the preferred, or the preferred orientation of the grating, right? And in fact, uh, tells you also what the, what the preferred direction of the grating in this case, a grating uh, that looks like this and that, uh, that uh, drifts towards, towards 11 o'clock. And this is a, a representation of it in terms of a linear plot where you plot uh, the spiking of the neuron versus the direction of the stimulus. And you see this is marked direction selectivity. Now, in order to um, understand uh, um, how those tuning properties of the neuron occur, we, need, we, want to, we want to isolate the thalamic input and see what properties are already present at the thalamic input. And in order to do this, we need to be able to isolate uh, the excitation that uh, originates from the <coughs> thalamus uh, from uh, the excitation that layer 4 neurons receive from other cortical neurons, in particular from other layer 4 corti cor cortical neurons. Um, uh, in fact, the vast majority of, uh, of uh, excitatory inputs that a layer 4 neuron receives is from other cortical neurons, and only about 10% uh, uh, originates uh, 
from the thalamus. So in order to isolate uh, the thalamic input electrophysiologically, we harness the power of inhibition in the cortex, and uh, we express uh, the um, optogenetic actuator channel adopting selectively in inhibitory neuron. And by illuminating the surface of the cortex uh, with uh, blue light, we can activate those neurons and essentially silence every single spike throughout the depth of the cortex in a pyramidal neuron, thereby isolating the thalamic input onto the neuron we are recording from. Right? And so this is a protocol that I'm going to use quite a bit uh, for the rest uh, of, uh, of the talk. So <clears throat> uh, before we go into the details of uh, direction selectivity, I need to spend a few words on orientation selectivity and on the receptive field structure um, of the thalamic input onto cortical neuron. And the reason why I first need to go on to orientation selectivity will become clear as we discuss direction selectivity. So what is the receptive field structure of the thalamic input onto a cortical neuron? And we explore this by presenting sparse noise, uh, uh, more or less randomly flashing little square of increases or decreases in luminance onto a gray monitor while uh, recording from a layer 4 neuron in a, a whole cell, voltage clamp, and silencing visual cortex. And what you observe, if you present uh, to stimuli a matrix of 8 by 8 onto your monitor, each square has about the size of 5 times 5 degrees, is that the vast majority of the monitor doesn't produce any excitatory current. Now, this is voltage clamp, so an excitatory current is a downward deflection. But for when uh, the black square, this is the, this is the response to black square, appears uh, here in this portion of the monitor, right, more or less at the center, maybe shifted slightly towards the right, that's the, that's, that's the, 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 the place where when you um, present a black square, you generate thalamic currents right, in this particular neuron. You could do the same with white squares, right? And what you observe is that, uh, uh, that the, 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 the spatial distribution of those white squares um, on the monitor necessary to evoke an excitatory current on the recording neuron overlaps the one of, uh, of black squares. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is uh, our population average. There is a large overlap, but uh, they are not uh, exactly centered, and this is quite important. Their peaks are separated on averages by 5 degrees. <coughs> and this is a, um, um, a profile uh, cut through the, the, the axis that connects uh, the two centers uh, of those receptive fields. You can see that there is indeed the separation at the peak. And this separation at the peak, first of all, um, this distribution of receptive field reminds what Reed and Al also described about 20 years ago. And it's very important uh, to provide the neuron with the response property to the, to the luminance edges. And uh, intuitively, this can be shown here. If you have a thalamic uh, receptive field structure in which you have an overlapping on and off subregion, which are, however, uh, separated by a few degrees, uh, the best possible stimulus right, to activate that thalamic input is a stimulus in which uh, a dark bar overlaps with the peak of the off receptive field and a white bar overlaps with the peak of the on receptive field. Right? And this is going to create a, a, a good, a, a strong uh, uh, thalamic excitation. On the other hand, uh, if that uh, grating um, shifts uh, just a little bit such that the black bar overlaps with the peak of the on receptive field and the white bar with the peak of the off receptive field, this is clearly a suboptimal stimulus and is going to produce uh, a minimum amount of excitation. Imagine now this uh, grating drifting, you're going to have this uh, amplitude modulation of the thalamic response from a strong thalamic response to a weak thalamic response, a strong thalamic response, a weak thalamic response. We call this uh, modulation F1 modulation because it contains the periodicity, main periodicity of the grating as it passes in front of the receptive field uh, of the neuron you are recording on. All right. Uh, clearly, if you present a grating which has an orthogonal orientation, right, now you never will have a, a, a pattern which uh, perfectly activates the receptive field of the neuron, neither one that completely suboptimally activates it. And so your F1 modulation is going to be, you're going to have uh, essentially as the gra uh, grating drift uh, an ongoing average uh, uh, activation of your receptive field, which is neither maximal nor minimal. And so the F1 modulation is going to be much less pronounced, right? And this leads to the fact that if you look at the F1 modulation of this thalamic uh, current, right, as a, a drift, uh, um, a grating drifts in front of the receptive field of the neuron, you have uh, essentially an orientation tuning of this F1 modulation. Um, and uh, this can be directly tested experimentally. 
we first uh, um, you can first, uh, uh, by using those, uh, those squares, uh, uh, de determine uh, the uh, spatial structure of the receptive field, right, for that particular neuron. And this shows that there is an off region here and a non region here. And this axis, right, which connects the peak of the on and the peak of the off, should define, right, uh, should be perpendicular to uh, the orientation, the preferred orientation of a grating. And this is indeed the case, because if we then keep that neuron now, instead of presenting square flashes, we start presenting grating drifting in uh, various, or grating, grating of various orientation drifting in different direction, right? You indeed see that there is a very close match between uh, the orientation and direction of the grating that produces the maximal F1 modulation and uh, the prediction simply based on uh, the organization of on and off subregion mapped uh, through this sparse noise, right? And this is, uh, this is the, the summary for, for a number of such experiments. So the on-off separation, right, uh, of the receptive field uh, predicts very well the preferred orientation of a stimulus uh, for uh, the F1 modulation of thalamic excitation. All right, so orientation tuning derived from the separation of on and on re off receptive field uh, in, uh, in cortical neuron. But what determines direction selectivity? How come that given a specific orientation of a stimulus, when uh, that grating drifts in one direction, the neuron responds very strongly, while when the grating uh, drifts in the other direction, the neuron responds much less? So again, let's look at, um, at, uh, at what happens uh, with the thalamic input. So this is, uh, this is a layer four neuron recorded in current clamp. This is uh, uh, for uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a very clear example of a directionally selective neuron. It responds well to uh, vertical grating, but in particular, if those vertical grating are drifting to the right, right, you see the oscillation of the membrane potential and a lot of spikes. While if that grating drifts uh, to the left, right, the response is much weaker. A classical um, directionally selective neuron. Now let's uh, uh, voltage clamp that neuron and silence visual cortex, right, in order to isolate the thalamic input as I showed you before. And this is the thalamic response, right, uh, to a grating, to the same grating drifting to the right. And uh, this is a cycle average, right, of this F1 modulation I was telling you about. And now here what you have is the same isolated thalamic input for the same grating, but now drifting in the opposite direction. And what's already very clear from here, right, is that the F1 modulation is much more pronounced when the stimulus drift in one direction as compared to when the stimulus drift in the other one. And in fact, there is a, a, a very uh, good uh, correlation between the amplitude of the F1 modulation of the thalamic input with the amplitude of the F1 modulation of uh, the membrane potential as shown here. On the other hand, if we look at the integral of the current, right, the so-called charge, it's the integral of the current in time during the period of visual stimulation, what you observe is that this charge is the same no matter what the direction of the stimulus is. Right? So what is this charge? This charge is proportional to the amount of glutamate that has been released from the thalamus onto this neuron. So the amount of glutamate that has been released from the thalamus to this neuron is the same no matter what the direction of the stimulus is, whether drifting to the right or whether drifting to the left, right? It's only the temporal distribution of this uh, release of glutamate on the neuron that changes depending on the direction of the stimulus. If the stimulus drifts to the right, you have those big bouts, right, uh, of excitation. Um, as shown here by this F1 modulation. If, on the other hand, the stimulus drift to the left, uh, the excitation is weaker, but more homogeneously distributed in time, okay? So the charge is essentially non-correlated or very weakly correlated, right, uh, with uh, the um, direction selectivity of the membrane potential. So the F1 amplitude modulation of thalamic excitation is directionally selective. How is direction selectivity of thalamic excitation generated, right? <coughs> And so thalamic excitation must summate in time more efficiently, since it's the same amount of thalamic excitation that you release onto, that, you, that, that, that your neuron receives no matter whether, whether the stimulus drifts to the right or to the left. But in one case, as it produces those very big peaks and valleys, right? Thalamic excitation must summate in time more efficiently in one direction as compared to the other. Thus, the time course of thalamic excitation must depend on the spatial phase of the stimulus. <coughs> 
And so to address this question, what Tony did uh, is uh, a very cute experiment. He uh, started first with drifting grating uh, while per uh, recording in the whole cell configuration from a layer 4 neuron while silencing the cortex and established which one was the preferred orientation and direction of the stimulus based on this F1 modulation. And clearly you can see here that in response to all those gratings, right, the preferred one is a, a horizontal grating drifting um, uh, downwards, right, is the one that produces the strongest F1 modulation. So now he took this, uh, um, the, 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 this horizontal grating and presented static gratings, right, essentially still frames of the movie of, uh, of a grating drifting down, but those are still frames, right? And so this is uh, one of the still frame, and if you present that still frame for 250 milliseconds, you get this thalamic excitation. Then you can present the next still frame, right? It's just a little bit phase up, right? And here you see that it produces a slightly larger thalamic excitation, and so on. And you can present um, essentially the 20 frames that make up a full cycle, or uh, 22 frames here. I'm showing just a few, right? And what you observe, first of all, is that uh, some uh, phases of the grating produces a larger current as compared to other phases of the grating. And this is consistent with what I told you before, namely that the <laughs> phases of the grating in when the black bar matches the peak of the off-receptive field and the white bar matches the peak of the on-receptive field, and so you get a larger thalamic excitation. While in other cases, it's not the case. But there is something, you know, for other phases, it's not the case. But there is something more important than this. You'll see that there are some phases, right, that produce fast thalamic excitation, and some phases that produce thalamic excitation that decays very slowly, all right? And so, if you see this response um, to static grating, one intuition would be, well, maybe uh, in order to uh, maximally sum this excitation, right, you want the phases that produce a slow thalamic excitation to precede the phases that uh, produce a fast thalamic excitation. Because if first you have a phase that produces slow thalamic excitation, and then the phase that produces fast thalamic excitation, fast thalamic excitation is going to be able to ride on the not yet completely decayed tail of the slow thalamic excitation. While in the other direction, that's not going to be possible. If first you have a phase that produces fast thalamic excitation, and then the one that comes with slow thalamic excitation, when, when the phase for slow thalamic excitation is going to appear, fast thalamic excitation will already have completely decayed. And so we can, we can clearly very simply test this by taking those various traces, staggering them in time as if the grating was moving, right, and see how they sum. And so now here is an example for four identical cycles. We take that little current here and we repeat it four times. Then the next current repeated four times. And they are staggered in time to mimic, right, a drifting grating. You take all of those currents together. Here you see the slow one that precedes the fast one, right? You sum them. Simply a simple sum of two gradients, and you see this very nice F1 modulation. Now, if you take exactly the same currents, right, but sum them in the opposite direction, such that the um, fast current precedes the slow current, right, you see that the F1 modulation is, uh, is strongly reduced, right? And in fact, there is a very nice correlation, right, between uh, the, um, the, the sum, the um, uh, great, the, 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 the direction selectivity index uh, of uh, the um, uh, responses to static grating and the direction selectivity index of the same neuron in response to, <coughs> to static grating. <coughs> Another way to illustrate uh, uh, the change in, uh, in uh, the decay time constant of thalamic excitation according to the phase of the stimulus is through this uh, special temporal plot. Here, on the x-axis, you have time. On the, on the y-axis, you have the special phase of the static grating that was presented. And the heat map is simply the amplitude of the current. Right? So you see here, for example, that around 225 degrees here, you have a current that peaks very early, but also decays very early because you go very quickly into uh, cold color. On the other hand, if you look at a special phase, which is at 135 around here, you have maybe less of a peak, but you have a current that lasts for much longer, right? So this is the special temporal receptive field of this neuron mapped uh, with grating of different phases. And if you look, <coughs> you, can, you can look at, uh, at uh, um, for, for five different time beams, right, uh, at the um, uh, center of gravity, if you want, for those five uh, uh, time beams of where 
of where the, 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 the current is. And you see that uh, it's not, there is, a, there is a, essentially an asymmetry, right? And this asymmetry predicts uh, the direction selectivity of this neuron, in this case, from phases, from slow phases to fast phases. And this is, um, this is uh, for all direction selective neuron, right? So, so what's important here is that the response to, just a second, the response to, to static grating um, presented at different phases predicts uh, the direction selectivity of the neuron. Yes? What determines the slow versus the fast? Well, the this is the second part of my talk. Give me, give me a moment. All right? So phase oscillating slow excitation precedes phase oscillating fast excitation for optimal summation, and this determines the preferred direction. What determines the time course of, uh, of, uh, of thalamic excitation? Very good. All right. And so I'm going to first propose that it's the duration of, uh, of firing of thalamic neurons, right? That uh, there are some thalamic neurons that in response to a, given, uh, a stimulus with a given special phase, fire long for a long time, producing a slow decaying thalamic excitation, while there are other thalamic neurons which look somewhere slightly off that um, uh, fire for a more brisk amount of time, producing faster um, thalamic decay. But in order to test this hypothesis, we need to make paired recording. We need to record from a cortical neuron, right? And we need to simultaneously record from those thalamic <coughs> neurons that impinge on that cortical neuron to see how they fire in response <coughs> to the various phases of the stimulus, OK? So with the whole cell recording in the neuron, we're going to have uh, the thalamic excitation, and we're going to know whether the thalamic excitation is fast or slow in response to the various stimuli. And uh, by recording uh, in the presynaptic thalamic neuron to that particular cortical neuron, we're going to know what is uh, the firing pattern of those, of those neurons. <coughs> so here's a cool example from, uh, from, uh, from this uh, series of experiments from, uh, uh, from Tony. This is a layer 4 neuron. It's clearly directionally selective. You see it, it, uh, it responds very, very nicely to those uh, uh, horizontal, uh, vertical grating and drifting to the right, but not to the left, right? And um, for that particular neuron, uh, Tony was lucky enough to record from two thalamic neurons, presynaptic to it, right? And the reason why we know they are presynaptic is that uh, if you align the spike, either spontaneous or visually occurring spike of this unit one, right, to a recording of this cortical neuron during cortical silencing in voltage clamp, you see a very nice excitatory postsynaptic current. This is a so-called unitary postsynaptic current. There is another unit that he could isolate, right? And this other unit also produces, in response to a spike to unit two, a spontaneously or visually evoked spike, <coughs> a nice excitatory, excitatory current. So now we have, for this particular neuron, this particular cortical neuron, we have two units in the DLGN that directly impinge on it. Let's see how they respond to the various phases uh, of uh, a vertical grating. And so this is an example of a phase of a static grating <coughs> that produces a relatively fast thalamic excitation. And this is in the same neuron, right? Uh, another phase of the static grating that, in contrast, produces a relatively slow thalamic excitation. When uh, you present this phase of the static grating, you see that um, unit one, this is the, in blue, is the peristimulus time histogram of unit one in response to this phase of the grating. This, the unit one fires very briskly, right? for the first uh, 20, 30 milliseconds, and then stop firing, while unit two essentially doesn't fire at all, right? In response to the appearance of the steady grating. If we show this slightly different phase of the steady grating, only offset by maybe 50 or 60 degrees, now the situation is very different. Unit one keeps firing, right? Maybe a little bit less, still very briskly at the onset of the stimulus and then stop firing. But unit two now firing, fires very much, right? And fires in a prolonged manner, consistent with the fact that the thalamic excitation that we were recording from that neuron had a, a much longer decay, right? So this particular experiment is uh, suggestive of the possibility that um, uh, thalamic excitation um, in response to different phases has different decays because uh, the thalamic neurons uh, uh, in the DLGN might fire either briskly or in a prolonged manner depending on the phase uh, of, uh, of the stimulus. That's in fact, nice. yes? Do you mean to imply that the onset is faster or that the cell is more transient? 
uh, the, 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 the cell is more transient. In fact, we didn't see, we, with regard to the onset, we can discuss it later. In this case, the onset seems to be a bit later. But, but the, the, the real difference, right, is a, a transient versus a sustained response, right? OK? All right. So we, <clears throat> this is one of the few examples in, in which we managed to get, uh, in which Tony managed to get two neurons impinging on the same cortical neuron, most of the 20 pairs uh, that uh, Tony got uh, during, during this series of recording were um, one thalamic neuron, uh, in, uh, one presynaptic thalamic neuron to a cortical neuron. And, um, and so to, to analyze this uh, statistically, what we did is uh, we did heat maps um, of the duration of thalamic excitation to the various phases. Those are the same thalamic excitation I showed you before, right? Here is uh, the phase that produces slow excitation. This is the phase that produces fast excitation. And then we compare them right, with the heat map uh, of uh, the presynaptic neuron. Here you have a presynaptic neuron that uh, it has a sustained response. right? And uh, you can see this on this heat map and this uh, transient response. And you can do this for uh, every phase of the stimulus for all 20 pairs that uh, Tony recorded. Right? And uh, what Tony did here, he ordered from uh, uh, fast thalamic responses to slow thalamic responses. Those are simply ordered across those 20 pairs for all the stimulus phases. Uh, th this is the summary of, of, of all those experiments, um, uh, ordered according to duration. And then for every one of those uh, phases, he can look at the peristimulus time histogram, the, the duration of firing of the presynaptic uh, um, thalamic neuron. And indeed, what you can see is that uh, Although this region is clearly undersampled because we have uh, only, only about 20 pairs, clearly uh, phases of the stimulus that produce fast thalamic excitation are generally accompanied by presynaptic firing in the DLGR neuron that is more brisk, more transient, right? You see the firing occurs here and much less here. On the other hand, phases of stimuli that produ pro produce prolonged thalamic excitation, right, are accompanied by uh, uh, firing of thalamic neuron that is uh, much more sustained, as shown by this upper part. Right? Another thing that I'm not going to show you here, but that it's important, is um, thalamic neuron are either transient or sustained. Right? You never, we never had, uh, we never countered a situation in which a neuron could fire in a transient manner to a given phase of the stimulus, and then in a sustained manner to another phase of the stimulus. So you have either transient thalamic neuron, right? those ones, and they only respond uh, to certain phases of the stimulus. And when they respond, they respond in transient manner. And then you have sustained uh, neuron, right, that only respond to other phases of the, uh, of the stimulus. And, but when they respond, they, sustain, they, they respond in a sustained manner. So transient sustained thalamic firing matches the time course of thalamic excitation. And so we can indeed uh, compare right, the special temporal receptive field of thalamic excitation right, for this particular neuron with the spatial temporal receptive field that we would get if we were to, uh, the, the, by, by, uh, by combining the firing of, uh, of, of those two, two units. So this is the, the, the spatial temporal receptive field uh, for the firing of unit one. As you can see, it doesn't really respond to all phases, right? It responds very transiently here. And it responds to those phases from between about uh, maybe 80 degrees to 290, but not to those one. And this is the um, special temporal receptive field of unit two. It only responds to those phases in a very sustained manner. If you combine it, you clearly have this asymmetric special temporal receptive field. And this asymmetry matches quite well the asymmetry of thalamic excitation that we observed in, this, in that particular neuron. So um, as, a, as, a, as a model, right, we have different spatial position of a visual stimulus activated thalamic neuron with distinct response properties, either transient or sustained, leading to fast or slow excitation in cortical neuron. And this can be modeled uh, uh, very, very simply. Imagine you have a transient neuron right, that uh, look at uh, a given portion of, uh, of the visual field and uh, responds uh, very briskly. And uh, by responding very briskly, produces, let's say, an excitatory current in the target cortical neuron that decays with a time constant of 50 milliseconds. Then uh, you have a sustained neuron. That sustained neuron looks at uh, a uh, slightly offset position in space, right? And it has a more sustained firing such that uh, when it fires in response to its stimulation, it produces an excitatory current in the racially selective neuron um, that decays with a time constant under 75 milliseconds. 
this is our modeled response uh, to the various uh, phases of the grating of our transient neuron. You see it's, uh, it has this F1 modulation and it peaks uh, at 225 degrees, right? And it has this special temporal receptive field. This is the response of our uh, sustained neuron, right? It also is uh, modulated uh, by, by, by the periodicity of the grating, but very importantly, its peak is offset. In this case, for this model, it's offset by 90 degrees, right? And so the sum, right, which is what is observed by the directionally selective neuron that gets those two inputs, right, which are per se not directionally selective, is this one, right? It's an excitatory postsynaptic current who has a, a fast component and a slow component of the K. But the relative contribution of the slow component and the fast component depends on the phase of, uh, of, of the grating, right? And by depending on the phase of the grating, it has an asymmetric spatial temporal receptive field. And in fact, if you sum to stimuli those responses in one direction or the other, in one case you have a very nice F1 modulation, in the other direction a very poor F1 modulation. And so this uh, essentially eliminates uh, model 3 as a major contributor of direction selectivity. Clearly direction selectivity is not inherited from the retina. It, um, um, eliminates model 1 as a major contributor for the de novo generation of direction selectivity in the cortex, but it highlights model 2, namely that direction selectivity occurs at the convergence of thalamic input with different spatial and temporal response processes, right? And so very quickly I would like to then, um, how many neurons actually contribute to the visual response uh, um, of, uh, of a cortical, how many thalamic neurons contribute to the visual response of a cortical neuron? Since we have pairs and we have the amplitude of a unitary EPSC, we can uh, convolve uh, the EPSC, um, the unitary EPSP, EPSC, with the firing rate of the thalamic neuron in response to a drifting grating. This is the peristimulus time histogram of this neuron. This is thalamic excitation generated by this, new, by this thalamic neuron, which is by, made by convolving this peristimulus time histogram with the unitary EPSC. This is the actual response of the cortical neuron to the drifting grating. And so you can see that this particular DLGN neuron contributed a little bit of the total current. And so you can look in general how much does it contribute. Every thalamic neuron contributes on average 1.25% of the thalamic current. And so on average you have uh, approximately 80 DLGN neurons that converge uh, onto a cortical neuron to generate uh, a visually evoked response. And so in conclusion, direction selectivity is computed de novo in layer four of mouse primary visual cortex, right? It's not inherited from the retina. Layer four neurons extract motion direction by combining thalamic inputs that are offset in space and in time, namely transient and sustained thalamic neurons that look at slightly offset position in visual space. And approximately 80 thalamic neurons contribute to the response. And this was uh, the work of Tony Lian. Thank you. Two questions. Um, did, did you compare the time constants of the unitary EPSCs from the transient neurons to the sustained neurons? Like, were they the same? Yeah, yeah they're very similar. Yeah. And then, um, can you also um, understand maybe like at the speed if you change the grading speed? Yes, you can. Predict? So, so essentially, based on uh, the response of uh, thalamic, um, uh, the, the, the thalamic response to static gratings, right? You can predict. Uh, what uh, the uh, temporal frequency tuning is of that cell. Now, we can predict it, but we didn't test it. And the reason is that those experiments are quite long, right? And so we, we, uh, we didn't have enough time to also explore the parameter space of temporal frequency. So our prediction have uh, remained untested, but clearly we can. Yes? So these uh, sustained and transient cells, do they correspond to like parvo and magna or different types? I, of I, I don't know. I don't know whether in the mouse those are uh, corresponding to magna and parvo. I'm not sure of any, of any data that would indicate this. I guess, it, is it a well-known distinction that already exists there? Like, the, there's already known that there's right. diversity so, is... So, so clearly it is, it is, uh, it is uh, um, they, are, they have been quite well characterized. Uh, um, even by a recent study by Pisco Poital in the mouth, there are those transient cells, those sustained cells. Now, how, how bimodally they are really distributed or whether it's a continuum, that's a, that's a matter of debate. But yes, uh, there, is, there is clearly a wide spectrum of response uh, uh, 
um, dynamics that have been well characterized in the mouse thalamus. Yes. Now, so have you recorded from a layer four cell that is not orientation selected, uh, that is not direction selected, only orientation selected, yes. and looked at see if the thalamic input is all, all of them sustained, for example? Mm. What's so yes, we've recorded from many of them. In fact, the majority of our recordings, 100, are from, <coughs> are from cortical neuron that we define as non-directionally selective. So there is a threshold for direction selectivity. Below that threshold, we decide that it's not directionally selective. And so what happens in those cells is not that they don't uh, uh, receive uh, uh, input from uh, either the transient or the sustained. They both receive input from the transient or the sustained. However, the, um, uh, the spatial separation doesn't exist. Essentially, the contribution of the fast and slow, the slow component in the thalamic excitation is the same at every phase of the stimulus. Yes. So in one of your early cartoons, your transient response had a much bigger peak, so that the area under the transient response was sort of equivalent to what you saw under the sustain. But it, it didn't look like that was represented in the data, right? It looks like the peak of the transient and the, and the sustained responses are about the same. Is yeah, about, yes. Off? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure which cartoon you are referring to, though. Well, is there a cartoon? Yes, no, uh, I didn't want to imply that is, anyways. It's not that one, that there are sort of equivalent numbers of spikes and one's very compressed. No, 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 no. Okay. You said they had the yeah, same um, interval. So in, in the cat, there was uh, a, a lot of uh, work on this idea, but uh, involving what they call lag cells yeah. in LGA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is anything like that observed in the mouse? Well, uh, so we, we, we thought whether, whether, whether we could, so first of all, uh, lag the cells um, as they find in the cat uh, and uh, also in the monkey, uh, have a very, very precise definition. It's not that they have some delayed onset. They, 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 they've been parameterized quite well. And so if we take those very strict definitions, then I would say there is not something like that in the mouse. However, if you look at the, pre, uh, at the heat map of the uh, <clears throat> peristimulus uh, time histogram, uh, well, I, I no, I don't have it. I don't have it here. Anyhow, uh, there is a, th there are some cells that um, have indeed uh, that are sustained and have indeed uh, a delayed onset, and so at least qualitatively they might resemble lag cells. We, we had maybe ten percent of those. Yeah, did you have any examples where a cell was? <clears throat> not direction selective when you when the full cortex was active, but became direction selective when you silenced the other cortex. Okay, yeah. So we we had that, and we even had uh, uh, the um, inversion yeah. of uh, so that it was directionally selective uh, when uh, the cortex uh, in one direction when the cortex in current clamp when the cortex was active, and then we silence. We look at uh, the thalamic input, and not only. It's, it's still direction selective, but in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so th those are a minority of cells, but there are two cells that, in fact, uh, uh, prevent us from having this pr a very precise correlation um, at the beginning. There, there is some noise. And so our interpretation to this is that, uh, um, as I was saying, cortical neuron receive, uh, uh, layer 4 neuron receive a lot of excitation. In fact, the majority of excitation from other layer 4 cortical neuron. In a previous study from Anthony, we've seen that uh, there is a good correlation between the tuning property of the thalamic input and the tuning property of the, uh, of the cortical input, right? So if uh, the thalamic input has a given orientation selectivity and a given direction selectivity, cortical excitation will tend to match that excitation, meaning that like to like excite each other. But this is not an absolute rule. So there are, there are situations probably in which uh, the overall response of the layer 4 neuron is in one direction because it receives that directional information from other cortical neuron. And since it's the majority of excitation, is going to respond like this. But the thalamus is actually telling it to do the opposite. Does this answer your, your question? Well, well, maybe not the same question. Maybe you can replace it. Can you exclude the role of recurrent uh, connections? In shape and direction. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. But in fact, what, uh, what, this, what, what those data are about are not about all the mechanisms 
that contribute to direction selectivity, right? There is clearly inhibition, spike threshold, a number of non-linearities. Here was, what is the mechanism in which the first seed for direction selectivity is planted in the cortex, right? You don't need any direction selectivity for, from each individual thalamic neuron, right, to create direction selectivity in the cortex. You just need this special temporal uh, offset, essentially. Once you have that special temporal offset, I'm sure that recurrent connection, spike threshold inhibition, are going to play a major role in sharpening and amplifying it, possibly. So there are some directionally selective neurons in retina and genicula, yeah. uh, and presumably the ones that you recorded from are not directionally selective. No, they are. They are. So they what are. do you think is happening? Very good. I, I have an answer for that, actually. So some of our neurons, <clears throat> from of our, uh, in our pairs, we had a thalamic neurons that were indeed directionally selective. Um, there, there, is, there is a description, depending on where you put your, your threshold, that 10 to 15% of neurons in the core of, uh, of the thalamus are, have directional selectivity. But there is absolutely no correlation between the direction selectivity of the thalamic neuron and the direction selectivity of its postsynaptic uh, um, and direction selective cortical neurons. So, so the direction selectivity in retina is wiped out? Right? It's essentially wiped out, yes. It's averaged out, I would say through those 80 convergences. Uh, I don't know if you know, the, but are, do the receptive fields of retina change at all between anesthetized and unanesthetized animals? Um, how do the receptive field change? So, so yes, there are changes in the receptive field right now. I, so the, the surround suppression is, uh, is, is different. So the size of the receptive field might be a little bit larger. Um, I don't think that the changes, at least the changes we are aware of, um, that occur through anesthesia, that those would affect, uh, would have a major effect on, on this basic mechanism. I don't think so. Clarify, this is the answer to another question. Is the direction selectivity highly temporally frequency tuned? That matches up exactly with the time constants of these slow and fast. And so these neurons are not directionally selected for very fast or very slow signal. Right. So, so as I said, we, we can predict their temporal frequency tuning, but, but we haven't tested. Yeah, well, you know, if you look at, if you, if you look at uh, in the mouse literature, there is, um, um, uh, there is essentially no database with regard uh, to um, um, that would allow you to make a prediction based on our, we, we search for it, but it's, uh, there, is n there is not a, uh, a very good database for it. And behaviorally, do mice only sense a certain set of speeds? Well, behaviorally, yes, but uh, whether this has to do with cortex or with supercollicals, that's a different question. Yes. So in thalamus, you have some distribution of these, you know, fast and then slower yeah. responses as a function of phase, and you can presumably know and characterize that distribution. And I guess my question is, um, are, is the distribution of direction selectivity in the downstream in the cortex um, consistent with a random projection of these fast and slow? Uh, I don't know. That's a very that's a very good point. Phases. So, um. <coughs> so whether if you were to take a a random group of um, 80 neurons yeah. and hook them up, uh, yes. whether you would, you would get uh, the right this... Um, of well, selectivity. so, so I, we, we haven't tested that, so I don't know. Really there is a, maybe, maybe you start with just uh, the random combination of two or three, and those could give you an initial bias, and then through Hebbian yeah, rule at the 80s. I, so intuitively, although we've never tested, I, I guess that if we just take a bunch of 80 neurons that kind of look more or less, uh, then, then I think it would flatten down. I have a hard time believing that you would have first this very nice F1 modulation and that you could get even that very sharp direction I selectivity. See. So you would say that it has to be feed forward plus some heavy learning. I, I would say so, yeah. So a prediction, <laughs> if you were to put ATB in the eyeball, would your cells completely mm -hmm. lose their direction selectivity? Under, under these conditions. All right. So, in fact, that's a question to you. So, so, <laughs> so, so you. So, so the first, the first thing is this. So, you with this, you are implying, right, yeah. 
that uh, sustain and transient is something that is purely inherited from the retina, right, in the sign. Is this correct? No, I was thinking more along the lines that you've got these spatially offset on and off. So yes, yes. If you're going to put in APB and take out the on pathway, all you've got is the off pathway left. Oh. So you won't have that. Ah, yeah, no, no, no. Yes, I remember that. Yes, no, no, no that's true. Yes, I, I would say, I would say that uh, if you you would lose both direction and orientation selectivity. Yes, absolutely. But then, uh, okay, yes, sure. I, I think, I think so. I think so. Couldn't you still have direction selectivity with two off cells, one that was transient, one that was sustained, if they happen to be spatially offset? Um, there are uh, no transient off cells. In the mouse, there is a you have a um, you have sustained on, sustained off, and sustain. Uh, there's a second. The, so there is out of the four combination, there is one which is missing in the mouse. I'm, I'm just making a point. You wouldn't, in principle, need. So on so and okay, off. very good. So so for orientation selectivity, you need on and off. Um, for direction, you could have two on, one transient, uh, one sustained uh, that are that are that are uh, that are just especially offset, and you would get it. That's true. Even a better answer. <laughs> okay, let's thank Massimo. Uh,